So let me go ahead and share my screen with you right now, just kind of walk you through some of the um, Fulbright web page here as it will sort of serve as our guide today, really for um, learning a bit more about the application components. So here we go. So I make this joke every time that I have to pull up the screen. Uh, this is Emmanuel Johnson right here. You're gonna get used to seeing his face. Here's somebody taking a picture on a wave. Basically what I'm saying is you're gonna be seeing this website in your sleep if you apply for the Fulbright program in the coming year. Um, we're gonna look a little bit more closely kind of at application components. So uh, the first place to really look for that and to sort of learn a little bit more about application components is simply by going over here to applicants and types of awards. I talked in previous workshops about countries and country descriptions, which you can find here. If you wanna learn more about eligibility, the Fulbright program in general, if you're looking for resources like videos and upcoming webinars, check out the tutorials page. And I'll come back to this just sort of the feature in case you haven't seen it. Um, for those folks who are you know, curious about statistics and how competitive is the country I wanna to go to, there is a small, statistics button right here that will take you to that. Again, I've kind of had this conversation with people before. I would not look at that unless you're really just sort of stuck between picking two countries that you have really good reasons for and you just can't choose. So you look at the statistics and you can see which one is more or less competitive. Um, but let's get right into sort of the application components for the study research awards. So as I've said to some people before uh, who are on this call already, the study research grant is really the more intensive of the applications when it comes to Fulbright grants. So it's not just that it's longer, it's also that it is a little bit more demanding in terms of what you have to include in terms of content. Uh, unlike the English teaching assistantship where you don't have to you know, make many decisions about where you're going to go teach or why you need to teach in a specific school um, for the study research grant you really need to give compelling reasons for where you want to go do your research project what your research project is why it needs to be done um, you're going to have to have some knowledge of research design and you're going to have to offer a whole number of other things which i'll talk about momentarily is there anybody on this call who is applying for a Fulbright Arts grant or is applying as a study research arts candidate? I don't think that there probably is, just looking at some of these names, but um, if there is anybody who is, then you can just let me know later on. Uh, they have this kind of organized in a strange way here, but let's see if I can get to the information that we want. Hmm. This is the types of awards, let's see. Application components, sorry, I'm in the wrong place. So you wanna to go to application components, which is right here. The reason why I asked for arts is because there's additional materials that you have to submit as part of that, um, but we're gonna skip that part of the tour because nobody's interested in the arts. And I guess that's a reflection of our emphasis on the humanities and arts these days. But anyway, let's go into the study research academic page right here. And you'll notice that there's going to be this really annoying kind of accordion style format that comes up. The first thing that you should know about the application really is actually where to find it. So if you go back up here to this bar in the applicants tab, there's a Fulbright online application link. You can click on that. And if you're a first time user, which I think pretty much everybody on this call is, you'll create an account. Um, you'll have to cover the password, uh, username, things of that nature. And then when you go in a second time or every time thereafter, you can just log in as a returning user. Pretty simple stuff. Uh, most applications for fellowships are online these days, so it's not unusual that it would run this way. When you go into the application, the first thing that you're probably going to find is a lot of biographical data. So they're going to want things like your name, shocking. You're also going to have to pick the grant type that you want to apply for. Um, they're going to be looking for um, the country that you want to go to. Some of you might not know that yet, so don't fill it out. Um, there's going to be other information about, you know, address, um, education. So once you pick the University of Houston in the biographical data section, I can then see your application in our Fulbright application portal. So um, I have access to that. And actually, if I scroll over this here, all applications, you can see 
you can, I can. I can see everybody who's applying for Fulbright at that point in time. And that's helpful because it allows me to make sure that you're still kind of keeping up with the process. I'm not gonna be spying on you like Big Brother. My tip with the biographical data part really is that I think you should try to knock out some of this information as early as you can. It's really tedious, easy stuff that probably if you did it all cumulatively, it would take about one to three hours um, to really kind of just write everything in there in terms of extracurricular activities, publications, if you have any of those. Um, so you could be filling some of this out already and saving your progress. You might want to go back later on as we're getting closer to the campus committee deadline and then the national deadline and putting in other things that you've been doing in the meantime so that um, you're able to keep updating your actual application. But the biographical data is by far the easiest part of this application to fill out. And if you have any questions about what's appropriate for some of this stuff, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, Fulbright will probably say something along the lines of, yeah, just put in extracurricular activities that are related to the purpose of your, your grant, which it might be research related or related to the mission of the award. That is helpful in terms of thinking about what you might want to select if you have a lot of activities. But I'll also say as somebody who's a reviewer, and I'm not just the Fulbright Program Advisor at UH, I also serve as a National Selection Committee member for one country and one grant specifically. I'll say it's helpful for us sometimes when we can look at applications and in the work history, for example, we see a student, and this is, a, this is actually a real example, I've seen a student who worked at McDonald's and you kind of might be thinking like, why would somebody put that on in, this, in the work section? You know, if it's not really related to what they're doing. But as reviewers, we look at that and kind of go, here's somebody with real life experience. Here's somebody who's working their way through college um, and willing to roll up their sleeves. Uh, we had a student apply this past year who actually worked um, as, I'll say, custodial technician, I think that's the word they prefer, or a janitor uh, for a number of years, just kind of as a part-time thing. And, you know, when she asked me if that was appropriate, I said, well, it's kind of outside the, the boundaries normally of what people put in there, but I think you should let folks know that you're somebody who has done that kind of work before. And so... If you have questions about what might be relevant or what might not be relevant, just ask me when it comes to some of these categories in the biographical section as you're filling out your application. The next thing that you'll have to address here really is program information. I would not bother with any of this right now. Um, it's mostly consists of abstracts that we as reviewers will read when we first start looking at your application. And these abstracts are, kind of a roadmap for the reviewer because they're little summaries of some of the most important parts of your actual application. So for the study research, the abstract or summary proposal, like what are you going to be going and studying? What are you going to actually go research in the country that you're proposing as part of your project? Um, or for your host country engagement, which everybody has to do, what is it that you're going to do for that? And plans upon return to the US, which you might not have thought about at this point, but um, the, po the point is, I want you to wait on this first. You can certainly be brainstorming and thinking about it because this information should reflect some of the stuff that you put in your essays, which I'll be talking about next. So it's not really advisable, I would say, to be introducing a lot of new information here. So if you, if you decide that your host country engagement project is gonna be one thing in the abstract and something else in the essays, reviewers are gonna kind of look at that and go, but I thought they said that it was gonna be this. Why does it say this, right? It's a contradiction. So once you have some of the ideas for your essays really formulated and thought out, then you can go back to the abstracts and start plugging in some of that information. So that is, but this is an important part. It's become an increasingly important part of Fulbright applications because like I said, it's really sort of a preview for the rest of the materials for the reviewers. Okay. So I'm gonna get into the essay part of this now, which um, is really sort of the meat of a Fulbright application. In fact, I would say this is where your application is going to live or die. And um, for the study research, I would actually say that the statement of grant purpose is really the one that matters the most. Because the statement of grant purpose is what you have to nail in order for a Fulbright committee to take you seriously. So 
For the study research projects, um, whether you're enrolling in a degree seeking program or you're applying for a specialty award, hey Nikki, I see you, you're out there, uh, or you're doing a research project uh, with an affiliation abroad, um, this is where you have to describe the who, what, when, where, why, and how of what you're proposing to do for Fulbright. It is sort of the action document, if you will. It's the project, it is the proposal. And so I'll come back to some of the criteria that are really important for this. But um, as Fulbright kind of points out here, you really wanna familiarize yourself with the award summary for your host country first. Um, know whether or not the theme of your research is something that they're really looking for or if something that might actually not be acceptable at all. Um, some countries have clear descriptions of project ideas that they do not want to receive, whereas they have others that they're actually pretty excited about. Um, if it doesn't say anything, you can pretty much assume that they're really open to any kind of project. So familiarizing yourself with the country description page for the study research is always important. If you're applying for study in a degree seeking program, not all countries that have study research grants will accept candidates for the study option. So you need to look at the country description page closely to see whether it says yes or no under the degree seeking option if you click on the research grant. And you know what, because I'm just so charitable with my time, I am actually gonna go over to one of these countries right now to show you what I'm talking about. Um, let's just pick on Indonesia randomly. So if you look at this country description page here, Fulbright proposal types. So you cannot do degree seeking there. You can only do research. Every country description page will have something that outlines this. So let's go back to the fun that we were just having. Okay, so you're back on this page here, statement of grant purpose. These are the questions that you need to start thinking about if you're gonna be developing a study research project. Who do you wanna work with? And some of this is gonna apply just for the research. Some of this might only apply for the study, but they outline a number of different questions here that you're gonna to wanna to be thinking about in your application. There are really two main criteria that you have to address in a statement of grant purpose. The first is whether a project is compelling. So Fulbright is an award that is about creating mutual understanding between the US and other countries. Any project that is really of benefit to both countries, both the US and let's just say Indonesia for the sake of argument, is gonna be a project that's probably gonna be more popular. Um, if it's something that directly examines the relationship between those countries, that's even better because it's examining the exchange. Um, if, but you know, that doesn't have to be that way. So you don't have to limit it to just that. Compelling can also mean that you're looking at a subject that is urgent it's controversial. It's something that just needs to be done or people are talking about right now. So that's usually what's meant by compelling. Um, you know, do you have an idea, as I observed during a national selection committee one time for India, Nepal, and Sri Lanka, where a reviewer just simply goes, this is just a, a project that's just dying to be done. Like we have to support this project. And if you can, get people on a campus committee here at the University of Houston to evoke that sentiment, then you're probably gonna find the same kind of um, reception with people at a national selection committee as well. The other part of it is talking about feasibility. So it's not just important to explain why your project is important and who you're working with and why this is of relevance to the US and to the country where you're going. It's also important to demonstrate that you can carry out this grant. So um, there's a lot of ways that you can demonstrate feasibility. First off, this is a nine to 10 month project, uh, or if you're doing the study, it might be only a nine to 10 month year that you're in the program if you're doing a one year program. And so how, you know, is the project that you're proposing for your research idea, is it something that can really be done in nine to 10 months? Um, you don't want to propose a dissertation type topic. You don't want to propose a, this is my life's work kind of topic. It needs to be a nine to 10 month project. And so that's something where talking to a faculty mentor, talking to myself can kind of help you 
think about whether you're being maybe a little too ambitious or whether you actually need to be more ambitious uh, in terms of filling your time. And what I want you to think about in that regard is, you know, it's not like you're going to just land in the country on day one, grab a quick meal and hit the lab or go straight into an archive. It's probably not gonna function that way, right? It's gonna be the kind of thing where, you know, you are gonna have to get settled. You're gonna have to take care of some administrative issues. You're gonna have to meet with your affiliation and I'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, you're going to, you know, really have to sort of get set up essentially in the country. So this is to say that another part of feasibility is having an appropriate timeline. What are you going to do when, while you're in the country? And have you set up certain milestones or mile markers for your project so that we can see that, you know, you're going to be working towards a certain goal over the course of your nine to 10 months to actually get this project done. Feasibility can also refer to your, the resources available for you to actually conduct your project. So it could be talking about your affiliation. Again, I'll explain affiliation in a second, but affiliation meaning the person that you're working with. Aside from just giving you a desk and a chair to sit in and a light that, or a room that has electricity and running water, are they gonna be providing you with other resources while you're on this? You know, are they gonna be giving you access to, let's say, um, you know, archives or to subjects to interview or you name it, fill in the blank, or data even, right? Uh, to carry out your project. Feasibility in this sense could also mean for resources, do you possess the language that you might need to actually carry out your project if your project is one that is a language dependent where you have to go talk to people or read things that are in a specific language. It could also mean having research experience. Uh, if you don't have any research experience and you're proposing to carry out a project that might be fairly involved, people are gonna notice that. You know, that's not going to get by the purview of a reviewer. They're going to notice quite quickly that you, you don't bring anything to this. However, on the other hand, if you're somebody who has done a bunch of graduate research already or undergraduate research, and you already kind of know how to perform a certain method, or there's certain transferable skills that you can bring from those previous experiences to what you're proposing to do as part of your Fulbright grant, that's great. And you should talk about that. Um, so that's a little bit about kind of what feasibility is. It's, it's resources, it's uh, an appropriate timeline, it's a project that actually fits the nine and 10 month period. Um, and sometimes it's also just the very nature of the project, right? It could be something that might be, if it's too politically sensitive, for example, or if it's something that just takes a long time to actually do, then it's not gonna be something that's really good for a Fulbright nine to 10 month grant. Let me stop right there and ask if people have any questions. And if this is a really long bar here in this gigantic statement of grant purpose page, if you scroll down, there's also information here about graduate schools. And for that, it's a little bit different. So if you're applying to do the degree seeking option, um, you really need to think about why do you need to do this program specifically in this specific country? Uh, you need to talk about different coursework that you'd be involved with, who you'd be working with as faculty. Give us a sense of what courses you're going to take when. Is there a final thesis, things like that, that you're going to be doing? That's, and do you have the language to carry out the program, things of that nature. That's what's really important for the, for the degree seeking option, but that's very specific to those candidates. Any questions so far about anything I said? I don't even know who's on this call, who's on this call. Okay, so we've already scared off a few people. All right, any questions so far? I have a question. Yeah. Um, at what point do you kind of need to know like what faculty you're working with? Like how far into the process do you need to have that information? Oh, that's a really good question, Anna. So um, we have people who find affiliations early on when they're applying, um, like now. <laughs> And um, they're already talking to that affiliation in the other country about what their project's going to look like. And they're working together. They're collaborating on a project idea for Fulbright. There's other people who 
find an affiliation much later, maybe in June, July, sometimes in August. September is really late. You can make it happen, but it's really late. Um, I would say that uh, this is a process, finding affiliation, whereby you really need to think about where you want to go. Um, so if you're really not sure where you want to be, just randomly reaching out to people is going to be kind of strange. So I think the best way to find an affiliation is to do a couple of things. You can uh, certainly work through your faculty at UH to figure out what kinds of connections they have in other countries. And virtual introductions are great. You know, it's a great way to sort of get yourself your foot in the door and, and meet people that way. Um, the other way to certainly do it is to do your own kind of research on people and then contact them in a form of cold calling. But, you know, we have people who do that every single year and actually get an affiliation. So it's not as if that's a process whereby you're gonna be less successful or um, you're not gonna get a good affiliation. We have folks who find people they've never met before to which they have no previous connection who then end up getting a good affiliation letter and being accepted to the program. So it's very doable. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks so much. Okay. Um, I'll talk more about the affiliation when we get to sort of the next section, but um, let me just say for the statement of grant purpose, it's a very unique way of writing. So many people probably have not engaged in that kind of writing before on this call. And it's unique because like it says here, you have to be very clear and concise. You just have to get right to the point. This is not an exercise in, you know, getting published in a, article for poetry. You know, they're not interested in style. There are no style points in a statement of grand purpose. You just need to get right down to brass tacks uh, pretty much from the get-go. And so that can be really hard. Um, even if you have all of your ducks in a row in terms of what your project is and in terms of who you're working with, uh, your community engagement project outside of your research, learning how to write in this very straightforward and sort of um, cut and dry manner is something you'll have to learn. And so that's where we really emphasize you starting early in this process to be able to submit a number of drafts. And we have people every year who start in May, June, July, <laughs> and end up writing drafts and do perfectly fine, but it will take a number of iterations. Other questions? Okay, there's some information here about formatting. Uh, you can read this on your own. I'm not going to go over explaining using one inch margin and 12, to 12 point font times New Roman here. Um, this is important, but it's just not really essential for what we're talking about today when thinking about the big picture. I will say though, do not try to skirt any kinds of formatting suggestions that they have here. I should say requirements. You know, don't put it in the header. Don't write it in 11 font reviewers will look at this really, really skeptically. And it's just an easy way to actually eliminate applications. So let me talk more about this gem right here, the affiliation letter. So I've been talking a little bit more about what an affiliation is and for the study research grants, not for the study part, but for the research, um, you are asked to find somebody in another country who's an affiliation. In other words, somebody who's gonna supervise and mentor your work and provide resources for you. Um, that person who agrees to write this or to be your affiliation, they have to write a letter. They have to submit that to you. It has to be on official letterhead. It has to be signed. And, you know, I would say the best letters probably end up being about one to two pages. Um, anything less than that is kind of like, I know the person's name, they have a pulse. They're going to be here. Grand. Let me know if you need any more information. Um, you want this to be a letter that sets a tone, uh, a tone of like being excited being opportunistic about working on something together with an American academic and talking about what you're going to be working on and how they can support you. But um, finding letters of affiliation can sometimes, or getting those can be tricky, uh, is as tricky as the affiliation process because you have to stay in contact with the person who you're proposing to have as your affiliation. And you want to make sure that you're keeping the channels of communication open and that, you know, in August when all of France goes on vacation and people stop reading their emails, you're not scrambling in September, early October to get an affiliation letter from them. 
So this can be really easy to procure and very straightforward. In some cases, it can be more challenging depending on the person that you're dealing with. Um, it's the affiliation letter should be written in English, but it doesn't have to be. It could be written in the language of the of their native language, but you will have to submit a translated version of it that's also signed by them if you opt for that. Most academics, I think, in other countries, though, are pretty comfortable writing in English. They might ask you to edit it, um, and you are welcome to do that. That is not a problem. It's not as if you're writing the thing for them. Um, Affiliation letters usually come from faculty mentors uh, or people at universities, or you can also have them from independent research institutes. You can have them from government agencies if that's a legitimate affiliation. You can also get them if you're an arts candidate, of which I'll remind everyone on this call, we do not have any, uh, from places like conservatories, things like that. So, um, you know, it's important, I think, as Fulbright states here, really to start early to think about who you could find. And then once you know that you have somebody whom you're working with to request the affiliation letter to actually get it, um, because you will need to submit that as part of your application. When I'm working more with you individually, we can talk more about how to actually approach people for an affiliation. I think it kind of varies based on the situation. Um, so, you know, that's something that we can, a bridge that we can cross together later on as you have more developed research projects or ideas for the research grant. Um, it's okay for them to send a scanned version of this or a digital version of it. It just has to be signed and be on letterhead. That's what really matters. Um, you know, they could send you a hard copy, but <laughs> it's the postal service. Who knows it's ever going to show up. So uh, I think that just sending a scan attachment is perfectly fine. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the personal statement here. So the personal statement is a one page document, single spaced. So it's half of what it would be for the statement of grant purpose. This is really your chance to talk more about your motivation um, for doing this project. And I'm going to say that the motivation for the project is key here for the research grant, unlike the English teaching assistantship where you might be talking about your motivation for, in one personal statement, teaching and exchange and the country that you're proposing to go to. For the personal statement in the study research grant, they care more about how did you come to this subject? How did you come to this idea? Why does it matter to you on a personal level? So I'll give you an example of something like that. Um, we had a student who, applied a couple of years ago and was a recipient for Bosnia. And she wanted to go to Bosnia to work on issues related to post-traumatic stress as a result of the, the Bosnian war that took place there. She was able to write a really compelling personal statement, I thought, about um, her family's background. She is Bosnian American and how her mother um, had come to the United States um, dealing with issues of post-traumatic stress as a result of the war that took place there, how that was something that got her really interested in psychology, and then working in a lab where people uh, were evaluating these types of disorders, and how that also just motivated her to combine these interests into applying for this specific project and for this specific grant. Uh, we had another guy who was a recipient from Mexico a couple of years ago who proposed a really good project as part of his dissertation related to borderlands research. He was actually born in um, Juarez, Mexico, which is where he wanted to go. And for the first five years of his life, he actually went to school in El Paso and then eventually moved to Colorado and did school in New York and then UH. But his project was very much about going and understanding the connection between Juarez and El Paso and sort of this border region during the early part of the 20th century, kind of before people just sort of made Juarez synonymous with, um, I don't know if anybody has seen the movie Sicario, but uh, the drug trade essentially in cartels. And so he was able to relate his own personal motivation. He actually had a great grandfather who worked as a customs inspector on the Mexican side that he later learned, who was probably one of these people kind of letting people come and go and pass across the border. And so that kind of personal motivation and background can really play a big part in explaining the research. 
uh, project that they've they've proposed and that's what you want to be thinking about as well uh, we had a student this is for uh, uh, this is for our potential Swiss applicant here I will say um, who a couple of years ago applied for a PhD study program actually uh, who want to do something on renewable energy. And she talked about growing up in a family where her father specifically worked in the oil industry and the insecurity around that job that he had and how this kind of really got her thinking about renewable energy. And she did an internship with BP, with wind energy. Then she went to Switzerland actually and did an internship, a research internship over there and proposed a really great PhD project that she wanted to do in Switzerland working with the lab where she was previously. But a lot of that came from her background as growing up as the daughter of somebody in Houston, shocking, right, who worked in the oil industry and kind of the role of energy in this state um, and the transition that needs to take place over time from fossil fuels to renewable energies. So my point here is to say that um, you really want the personal statement in this case to complement what it is that you're proposing for your research. That makes for a really compelling story. Uh, we don't, or for your study, Nikki, um, we don't need to know about like how you, <laughs> how you love bike riding and your project is about something totally unrelated to that, right? We don't need to know these random personal aspects of your life. Try to connect it more to the thing that you want to do whether it's study or research and where you're going. Um, I will say that the personal statement is probably not as important in the study research grant as it is in the ETA. You have to nail the statement of grant purpose first. And then if you have some great things to say about yourself in the personal statement and you have a really compelling narrative about why you've gotten into the subject that you're studying or researching, that's sort of the cherry on top, right? That's just, playing with house money at that point. Um, the statement of grant purpose probably matters a lot more in most of these competitions because you have academics who are really scanning closely to see, uh, you know, are, is what you're proposing compelling, feasible, et cetera. Questions about any of that? Okay, so I'll move on to a couple of other items here that I think are a little bit easier to, um, address. One is the foreign language evaluation, and you can go and read a lot of this in your own time. But for both the study and the research, if you are going to a country where there is a language requirement, you will have to do a foreign language evaluation. A foreign language evaluation is something that we help you organize, usually here at the University of Houston. So if we have somebody, you know, let's say you know, Julia is applying to go to Switzerland, she needs a, an Italian foreign language evaluation because she wants to go to a Swiss, an Italian speaking university in Switzerland to do a research project. Well, in that case, we would reach out to the Italian department. We would ask if there's anybody there who could just evaluate her. It doesn't matter if she grew up with this language her whole life and you know might claim to be a native speaker. There has to be a language evaluation to attest to this. Um, I suggest usually to most students that they try to do their foreign language evaluations in September because it'll give you a little bit more time to practice the language if you haven't been using it recently or if you feel comfortable enough because you just use it in the home or in your daily parlance, then you can do it whenever you want. But we can help you arrange um, those evaluations. If it's a language where we don't have it at the University of Houston, then it's okay, um, it is permissible to actually get somebody from outside of UH to do it. So the example that I give here is a colleague of mine at Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts. He's had students who have applied for Ukraine before. Ukraine, so far as I know, does not have a language recommend or requirement. And I'll get to that in a minute, but because obviously Ukrainian is not taught at any institution probably in the US, um, it's okay to have uh, somebody else do it outside of the you know, the college there. And so they've had like Ukrainian, priests from Ukrainian churches do the evaluation and that's perfectly fine. If it's a really, it's, if it's a much less commonly spoken language. Um, if you're applying to a country to do research where there's not a language requirement, but you might know the language or one of the languages there, you can also submit a foreign language evaluation for that. In some ways that's quite helpful because 
um, you know, you're able to demonstrate that, hey, outside of the lab or the archive or my graduate program, I'm going to be able to go out there and have conversations with people and learn more about this place and convey information about the US. And that's what Fulbright wants you to do. That's part of their mission. So that's a really attractive option. And I encourage you to do that as well. Um, there's another point I was going to make about that. The language evaluation is really important for the research one in the sense that if you have to do something that involves language as part of your research project, you absolutely have to know a certain level of German, French, Spanish, whatever it is to carry out the project. And so if you're a beginner German speaker and you're proposing to go read in an archive 16th century German literature, probably going to be a problem there, right? That's not going to be an easy thing to pull off. Questions about the foreign language evaluation? And keep in mind that you have to be at the level on the website that they, if there's a requirement, by the beginning of the grant period. So even if you're not there at the time of your evaluation this coming fall, but you have plans to continuing learning the language, um, that's something that'll be really helpful and you should certainly mention. It's also not a bad idea to suggest in your community engagement project, for example, that you want to learn a little bit of language while you're in country so that you can keep practicing it and getting better at it uh, and just be more communicative with everyone there. Okay, I'll also say that the foreign language evaluation is the kind of thing where you actually have to input the person's name in the application to generate an automated email that will go to the person who will evaluate you. This is kind of inside baseball here for this stage of the game, but um, that once you know who is going to be doing the evaluation, once we've asked somebody or you've asked somebody and they've agreed, <laughs> important point, they've agreed um, to actually do the foreign language evaluation for you, then you can input their, their name, their email address, in your application, you'll see a spot for that when you actually open one and they will get an email. Um, once this comes up, you should tell them to check their spam and it will um, come with a set of instructions and they will, then you'll set up a meeting with the foreign language evaluator and they'll just test you based on reading, writing, speaking, and listening, however they see fit. Then they'll submit the evaluation directly to the application at the end. So there's actually, nothing that you really need to do. Look at that, we lost Jeff. Okay, so uh, let me get to the next point here. We got the serious folks on the call now. Recommendations. The live information here, and I'm just gonna kind of give you the bare bones of it. In fact, I'm actually just gonna close this so it's less overwhelming. The recommendations for the study or the research are letters. Um, that might seem self-evident, but if you know anything about the other grant, the ETA, um, the ETA is for forms, so they don't actually write letters for the English teaching assistantship. Rather, people submit forms that have pre-generated questions that ask the recommender to talk about certain aspects of the candidate. For the study research, um, it's similar to the ETA in the sense that you actually have to go into the application, just like the foreign language evaluation, you have to register people in there so they will get an automated email with instructions to do the letter of recommendation. However, they actually submit a letter. It should be on official letterhead. It needs to be signed, it should be dated. Um, but let me just say a couple of words about the recommendation process. You really want to um, not just pick people randomly here. For the study and the research, you want to be very strategic in terms of who you pick. So if you're doing a research project, I would definitely suggest picking people who have seen you do research before, who can attest to your ability to carry out a project from beginning to end, or to work in a team, or to use a specific method, any of that. And the more people you have attesting to the research part of it, the better. Um, people who've seen you in academic context are also really good for this. So whether they've had you in class or multiple classes and you've done well, that's a really good recommendation as well. Beyond that, I would not stray to other people. You don't need people to write like a personal testimony about you from your best friend. Um, you know, character testimonies just are not going to help you here. Don't pick somebody who was like a supervisor on a part-time job, summer job like that. For this application, it's pretty, pretty standard that you pick somebody who's seen you in a classroom or seen you doing research. That's what's gonna matter the most here. 
Um, I kind of encourage but also expect students applying for the research or study research grant really to reach out to me beforehand so that we can talk about who might be a good recommender for you kind of along those lines of what we were just talking about you know I'll suggest maybe proposing three to five names of, of folks who you think are really good and um, we can kind of go back and forth and talk about yeah maybe this person would be good because they'll say this once we've narrowed it down to three then you can go ahead and register them in the portal so they get the emails but the reason why i tell you to do that is because if you pick somebody who might be a terrible recommender and you then register them and they submit a letter we cannot get that letter out of the portal at that point only the person who wrote the letter can actually get it out and they have to write to Fulbright directly to get it out of the portal, which is rather embarrassing because then you have to go to them and say, could you please remove your letter? And they might ask why, then we have another conundrum. So it's really important to think beforehand who you're gonna pick rather than just sort of rushing into this, pro this whole process. Questions about recommendations? I have two questions. Sure, Julia. So it's three recommendations? Correct. And we're allowed to see the recommendation beforehand, is from what I'm understanding, or we only see it once they submit it, or can we? Because sometimes professors will like send you the recommendation, and say like, "Oh, is this like how you thought you wanted me to write about?" Would that be okay, or is that not? So allowed? ideally, you'll never see the recommendation. Um, yeah. You cannot see it in your application when it's submitted. Um, they so how really, would you, oh. they really shouldn't have a reason to send it to you beforehand. Uh, you know, you shouldn't actually write the recommendation for them because that's unethical and some faculty put students in a really awkward position in that regard. What I would strongly suggest is meeting with these folks beforehand to talk about what might be worth putting in a recommendation letter and why you're asking them so that, you know, it doesn't have to be a lot of back and forth. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I just didn't understand how you would know that there was like a bad recommendation. Unless you won't. You... I, okay. I can see that and I can kind of oh, nudge okay. you. Um, and I might say, gee, Julia, like, you know, is there somebody else that you might have other than so and so? Okay. Yeah, that's okay. my way of diplomatically addressing this. Nikki, you have your camera on. I feel like you're going to ask a question. Okay, we're just seeing you for the first time. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I was just doing something else. So. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a question. Yes. Um, I didn't hear you mention this, but does the recommendation letters have to be from professors only? It could be from potentially a staff person, but I guess it would really depend on the capacity in which you know them and how they know you. Um, it could also be somebody maybe at a, a research institute where you've done like R&D or it could be somebody from an internship who's seen you do research. Um, those folks would be okay as well outside of a university, I think. So it can be from anyone, essentially. I'm oh, sorry, I didn't hear the second part of that one. It could that? be from anyone, essentially. It could, but I would really caution you on picking people who have no understanding of your ability to do research or have any understanding of your academics because that's really what you're being assessed on here. You don't want to pick some random person that you just had for an internship, like a political mm -hmm. internship, where you were canvassing neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. They're not going to have anything to say, probably. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Would that also apply to the uh, the study? research the study like, depends on the context so like if you were doing a political science degree that you were proposing and it was somebody who you worked with like an ngo who saw your work and saw how committed you are saw certain aspects of your work that might be pretty good okay That's yeah helpful. i pick on the, the political ones because they tend to write really lousy ones so um they tend to overemphasize the um the um I'm blanking the uh the name on the the recommendation form more than the actual content of the recommendation 
So business people kind of tend to do the same thing as well. And do you think the year, the amount of years that you know them also should say something? Do you think there should be a limit or a minimum of how many years you've known a person? No, I don't think so. I don't think there can be too many, <laughs> obviously. Um, in terms of a minimum, you know, if you knew these people for two weeks, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> how well could they really <laughs> know you? you know in, I mean? a, in a year or something, you know, is a year too short? Oh, no, I don't think so. Okay. No. That's a, that's a legitimate question. I have a specific question for a specific country. Okay, Ruth, go um, ahead. So I, was I would like to do my research in Nigeria. Um, and I was looking at the website for specific considerations. And it says that candidates with projects in the Niger Delta and certain parts of Northern Nigeria would not be considered due to security reasons. Um, how do I know like what areas in Northern Nigeria are prohibited? I would big, probably just say all of Northern thing. Nigeria, if I'd be perfectly honest with you. Um, okay. You know, you could, so there's that. You could specifically look at the State Department website uh, mm -hmm. because the Fulbright program is run out of the State Department, technically. Uh, you can look at their travel warning list and like for most countries, they'll tell you specifically where in the country you really shouldn't go. Um, if there's any kind of doubt as to whether your location is going to be one that might not be safe, the Fulbright will just put the kibosh on it. So you really should avoid any kind of complexity in your application when it comes to that. Okay. Yeah. And what is affiliation fees and tuition? What is that? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part. Affiliation what? A affiliation fees slash tuition. Like it says it on the website. Uh, let me open this here. I mean, you shouldn't have to pay any fees. It says it's tuition not covered in grant benefits. Oh, yeah. If you were, I don't know, if you were enrolling in a course as part of while you were doing a research grant, then an affiliation might talk about that. Mm -hmm. That's really not something that comes up, though, to be honest with you. Okay. All right, let me get to the last one here, really, which is transcripts. So you will, for the campus committee deadline, you can submit an unofficial transcript. That's perfectly fine. I think that the UH, the UH campus committee, or long day, the UH unofficial transcripts look terrible. Um, they don't have any insignia. They don't even have the University of Houston's name on it. I mean, it looks like somebody could have just typed it up in their, in their bedroom and printed it out. So that's fine for the campus committee evaluation, but I really encourage students to get the official transcript for the final application for the national deadline. It just presents itself better. It's official. Um, it does cost money. So if you're ordering it online, it'll cost, I think, $12 that you can get it from the registrar's office. You really don't need to order a transcript until probably just after the start of the fall semester because you still want all the grades that you might have gotten from outstanding summer courses or spring courses to really be captured in your transcript, especially if you know, you've done well in those courses, right? It speaks in your favor. But if you've attended previous institutions, like let's say you transferred in from a community college or another university if you're an undergrad, or let's say you're a graduate student and you went somewhere else for undergrad. So if you're a graduate student, you definitely need your official undergraduate transcript. Um, if you're an undergrad and you went to, I don't know, San Jacinto or HCC before this, and the grades are covered, like you can see them on the UH transcript, then you don't have to order one from your previous institution. I kind of suggest it just because it covers all bases. So if you have specific questions about previous institutions where you've studied uh, in regards to a transcript, then just let me know and we can address those bilaterally. Recommendations in terms of timeline for that, I really think that you can be having conversations with people in the summer about having them write a lot of recommendation for you um, and then asking them at some point in the late summer so that you're well ahead of the fall deadline would be a good idea. 
the personal statement and the statement of grant purpose are both documents that you're going to really want to work on throughout the entire summer and going into the fall. Can I ask, so for the transcripts, you know, I, I had um, Swedish transcripts and then I basically transcribed them through the U of H system to get them accredited. So if they're kind of already translated in Texas academics, do I need to get the official like transcript from Sweden? That's a question I probably have to pose to Fulbright if I'm being honest with you. So I don't know how many Swedish transcripts they get from people who didn't actually enroll in a degree seeking program at a Swedish university. So, cause you were in a degree seeking program, right? I was in one and then yeah, left early and then was doing just individual courses. Yeah, that's going to be uh, one for them to have to decide upon. But you might be thinking a little bit about if you do need to get official transcripts, how you might do that over the summer so that we leave ourselves enough time. Yeah, it's, yeah, okay, sounds good. It could be a lot of fun or no fun. No, I mean, I know how to do it. I already did it through U of H system, so it's just a big pain. But yeah, let's okay. do it again. That's not All good. Right. Any other questions related to any of these topics here? There's a final one here about ethical requirements, which they really encourage you to look at. If you're gonna be working with human subjects as part of your research grant proposal, probably not for study, then you're gonna to need to talk about getting IRB approval. Um, and that's something that you're gonna to wanna to talk about with your affiliation as well. But any other questions regarding the application components for the study research grant? If you haven't already, I would definitely encourage you to schedule an appointment with me. Ruth, I saw you email me today and I'll get back to you. Um, I think Nikki, Julia, Anna, we have a meeting coming up, but Ricky, uh, Nikki and Julia, we've already talked. So um, we'll just keep talking. All right. Well, that is all I have to say about this. Um, now it's sort of a matter of picking countries, thinking about projects and programs, and then getting to the writing process. So I hope you all have a good rest of your day. And if you have any other questions, you can just follow up with myself or Nimra uh, directly. All right. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah.